everyone, Robert here with Lone Star Percussion, and we are super excited to have with us two amazing percussionists that are going to be doing a clinic here in a few moments. I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves. On the far right, we have Fausto Cuevas, and in the middle, we have Glenn Caruba. And uh, like I said, these guys are about to do a clinic here. Uh, Fausto, uh, where were you born? Where are you from? I'm from Brownsville, Texas. Oh, Texan. Yes, sir. High five on that. Yeah. And That's Glenn. Awesome. Miami, Florida. I was uh, born in New York, but pretty much raised and did all my schooling in Miami, Florida. Cool. Are you guys uh, both from musical families? Or is that like in the house or not at <laughs> my all? My family, they're all cooks and chefs and stuff. Cool. So how did, how did the bug bite you? Where, where did that come from? Man, since, since I was a little, little kid, I just wanted to play drums. Really? Yeah. yeah. Since I knew, I knew from a young age that in life, I was going to play drums. That's, That's awesome. What I wanted to so, do. Start off on the, the boxes and pots and pans. I started out, yeah, and those, the, the holiday cookie tins. Oh, nice, and nice. Then, and then, yeah, the, the, the phone book. And I, I had the Pringles cans. <laughs> I, had, I had like the Octobon Pringles cans and the pillows and I had it all. Sweet. So, and did you come? the best sounding Pringles can. Came nice. Ever. And they, they would change the pitch as you did. <laughs> exactly. Did, did uh, you come from a musical family? No, not at all. Just really? uh, started out. Uh, on guitar and just kept trashing them and just went on to drums after that about age 12. That's awesome. Yeah. Like trashing guitars like Pete Townsend style? or Almost. Just, uh, yeah, I couldn't keep a, a string from breaking it seems. So That's I awesome. Like, Doing the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice, man. Um, did, uh, so you started, what'd you say about like at young age, like four? No, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, I knew that I wanted to play drums and I was into drums, but I was kind of, I played you know, all kind of sports and stuff. And then it wasn't until I was in sixth grade, you know, how Texas at the school system and the, the music and, and the, so, I, yeah, start, I started at 11 in sixth grade. Like doing the, the, the beginning all percussion the thing. Beginning percussion stuff and then the, all the marching stuff. And then uh, I was 15 and I got my first drum kit. I begged and pleaded my mother and father and I got a Pearl Export kit, black. Nice. When I was 15 years old. Was so, it the yeah the eighties Pearl export like it with was, the uh, 12, 13, 16. Like deep tom twenty two yeah nice yeah man I still have it too and it still sounds yeah amazing. those kits yeah I don't know they were magic yeah they still were. I mean are magic they, they they work really well which is a perfect segue for why and how we're here today Pearl Drums uh, is sponsoring this entire clinic with these two gentlemen and Will Kennedy and so you did the the. The Texas band thing, yes, marching band, yeah. the whole thing. What did you play in marching band when you were in Snare drum. Nice. Traditional yeah. grip or match grip? Traditional grip. Right on, man. Yeah, man. And what, what about you, Glenn? Did you do the, the school thing? I did. You know, started out in middle school, learning all my rudiments in, in, in Miami, and uh, just kind of worked my way up to playing in the jazz band. And then right around uh, 1980, there was a huge... Um, migration of Cuban immigrants that came over. President Carter let everybody in. Right. And, um, you know, I was just going into middle school, so there was a, a, a lot of Cuban kids that I was just meeting for the first time. And then that's how I kind of got into the, you know, the, the Latin music, uh, just because now my new friends that were joining, my new classmates, um, were all these Cuban kids and uh, kind of grew up that way with it. Yeah, so. you just got, you were thrown, yeah. swimming in the deep end, that's basically. It. That's it. That's, that's yeah. You know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys was like, uh, since both of you studied properly, I believe you went to Berkeley, correct? Mm, yes. And I went to Florida International University. So, yeah. but I'm sure that there's been a lot of street learning, as I call it, like learning from yes. the, the legit people that grew up with it. Um, how, if you had to weigh the proper schooling versus I, my term, the street schooling, and they're both valuable, but is one with you guys, what you do today as percussionist, is one more valuable than the other, or are they about even? Well, it's a loaded in, question. In, in my, yeah, it is. <laughs> in, in my experiences, um, the way I feel about it is you need to go to school, but you don't finish school at school like you can graduate but then when you get on the street it's nothing like it is in school 
Right. School is this world that that is in four walls, and it's and it's your you can be great there, but then when you get on the street, and you see some older man that grew up with it, or all of a sudden he does something, or she does something that is plain, and you're like, what is that? And and it, and and those are the the school of hard knocks that I like to call it. You know, that's right. when you grow up somewhere and you you listen to these different styles of music or they, they just learn it from the raw element of just being a part of it, living in it, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, we have some of that in Texas. I know a lot of people don't talk about it, don't know about it, but, you know, all the Norteño music, all the, the Tex-Mex music right. and all that stuff, I mean, I mean, you see some of those drummers, man, and it's like, wow. And they didn't go to school, you know? Right. A lot of them... You know, I, I'm not seeing a lot of them, but I, I, I've known some that didn't even get to finish school because they started going on the road and getting, by the time they're sophomores, juniors in high school, these dudes are making money and they're on the road and they're playing, and, but the talent, the raw talent. And you can get any person from any walk of life to listen to that and say, oh, it's just a polka. Yeah, it's not just a polka. Right. Because it has the nuances that you wouldn't get at a school, but you get it on the street. Right. So it's just the, the experience. So to answer your question, you need the school, but you need the street more. You, that, that's like the doctorate. Right, okay. You graduate from school and then you go to, to, to the real school and you that's when you learn how to really play. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the real life application of doing something out in the field or in the studio, live on stage, uh, something that think you can get prepared for in a classroom but until you're actually out there doing it uh it's not going to happen and then like Fausto said you know I, I I used to work at a music store down in Miami and um after my classes were over in, in university then you know everybody would hang out there and we'd have our our jams and our rumbas and uh you know that's where you start to really figure things out and really hear how what the notes on the paper meant but how it's really applied and 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 really figuring out how to make that work in a professional setting you know that's that's cool and it, it's interesting to find that guys who are on the level where you guys are they the story seems to be pretty consistent you Absolutely. know there because there are the guys as we i know some guys i know you know more people than me but uh they're the guys that never went to school can't read a lick but they're amazing players sure. and they have that that intangible thing that you, you can't teach you right. just it's either there or it's not you know and uh, it's as I grow older I, I you know I graduated from you know University of North Texas and thought I knew a lot of stuff and then I you know saying sounds like you guys had similar similar experiences exactly yeah that's cool so when you were younger kind of I'll go backwards for a second what, what was uh, your first pro gig my first pro gig was playing with my own little jazz fusion trio, the New Project Jazz Group. And this is my high school buddy. We're still going to high school and playing in clubs on South Miami Beach. And I remember we would play until, you know, one in the morning. And then only one of us had a license to drive at the time. So we'd all pile into the car and then you know, come back and we'd just be red-eyed the next morning in high school, mind you. Wow. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just, just kind of like a jazz fusion trio later, a quartet, but actually got money, got paid for it. And, were you uh, uh, playing drum set? Or? I, yeah, and actually then it was kind of like I was starting to dive into the hybrid thing and having a, a, a conga on my left and uh, a little bop kit and um, starting to get that influence from my new friends. So Those new friends have been a play a great part of your yeah, life. Yeah, it, it was like, awesome. It was do awesome. you still speak with any of those guys? I do. Yeah, nice. yeah so they're still like stay in touch. Buds. And, yeah, they are. Yeah, That's everybody's cool. getting a little bit older, but we have some great stories. That's awesome. What, what was your first pro gig, Fausto? Yeah. South Padre Island, spring break 1990, at a dive bar with a band called Live Bait. It was uh, just a trio. I was playing drums, a bass player, and guitar player. That was you? And uh, <laughs> Spring Break 1990, South Padre Island. That, man. I've, we got, uh, yeah. I may have been there. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I was 16 years old. I had about uh, four four uh, buckets full of beer behind me because every time, it just, you know, 
finish a song. It was like, ah, it's like, hey, I'm college the kids. You're the best in the world. And yeah. here, and, uh, yeah, I was wow. pretty amazing. Yeah, at 16, you know. Yeah. Um, that was some life skills being learned by oh, you on the stage, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, Padre Spring Break, man. man. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's nutsville. So, uh, <laughs> so you guys both started off like pro gigging on, on drum set. And then when did, how and when did this whole percussion thing, which you guys do for a living now, how did, I mean, you kind of said it. How did you kind of get into that? Okay. I, when, uh, when I went, when I went to, to Berkeley, I went there in 1993. Um, I, I was a, I wanted to study jazz drums, right? So I went there cool, 93, 94, and, and um, I got really like overloaded with too much information, too many styles. I wanted to be the guy that played straight ahead bebop. I wanted to be the guy that played funk. I wanted to be the guy that played Latin jazz. I want to be the guy that played you know, Africa. I went, and it was it was too much. You know, at that time, you know, Berkeley has a rating system that when you're per, you know going there for performance, you you try to do all this stuff so you can play in these ensembles and audition to get a higher rating. You know, just so you can, I don't know, it's just I guess yeah, that's the thing that Berkeley. You, know, yeah. you have the higher rating, you're like you know you're like somebody that ooh that guy's got like all sevens or whatever. At the end of the day, you know. It just, you know, it's, 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 it, it was, for me, it was too much. So I have a friend of mine who um, was from Panama and, and, you know, we were on, on uh, you know, I was coming up the elevator to, to, to my dorm and I heard this cowbell going on in this room. It's like, boy, big boy. Hey, homie, it was going crazy on that cowbell. And I, and I kind of like saw him and he, I opened the door a little bit. I knocked and he's like, hey, you know, he, he called me Faustivity. He said, Diddy, come here, man. Hey, you know, check this. You know, it's down. He was he was watching the New York Salsa Festival. He had a, a, a videotape of it. And he was watching it and playing cowboy. He's, you know, a great, he's a great percussionist too. His name is Renato Toms. And uh, he sat me down at a conga and he said, play this. And he kind of showed me a little marcha and a little tumbao, you know, and, and, and uh, so we can both you know, play to this 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 VHS tape, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man, and I was at a moment in my life where I was overloaded, and I was really not happy with what I was doing on the drum set. So when he sat me down at that coma and I started playing, man, it just started feeling like really, really great, and I just it just took me in. It took me in. I put my drum set away. I put it in cases. I used the bass drum as a table to eat on. Um, and I didn't touch a drum set from about 95 to about 98 when I got called from Julio Iglesias, uh, his offices, they, they were auditioning drummers. So, yeah, wow, and I just, just, I just was immersed in the whole culture and, you know, um, Giovanni Hidalgo was around Berkeley at that time and I had started um, I met Negro in 93, Horacio, so he was, those two guys were, I mean, gigantic um, inspirations and like, mentors, and they were just so, so real. We all really um, we just, you know, we understood each other, so it was really. There's a bond there, yeah. that's cool, and those guys, I, I've met Horacio several times, and he's just, he's got this magnetic personality yeah. that, he he's never met a stranger in his life. No, nope. and I could you know if you're at a, you know I could see where if you were at the point where you that you were describing, and somebody like that comes along, in addition to your your, your other buddy, it's like man this is yeah. this is the way yeah that's cool. So it was it was just being the right place and being around the right people and you know like I said, I sat down you know Renato taught me a little bit and I, I just learned that and I, it just. It was a vortex, man. It was just a, just sucked me in, and I, and from there, other than that one audition that I did with Julio Iglesias, and I actually got the gig, and I played drums with him from uh, about well, I would say like maybe April '98 to uh, probably about October of '98, and then no more drum set gigs and everything else was just all percussion, spin all percussion. That's crazy. Do you, 
But do you either one of you guys still just for kicks sit down behind the set and go crazy, or do you even have time in your schedules? I do. I still I still record in Nashville and do um, session work on both drum set and percussion. So I'll, I'll I'll actually, you know, lay down the drum bed and then stack percussion on top of that over my own parts. So that way I know where to lay out and what I'm going to fill in later. That's that's cool. So you're a uh, you're a uh, your clients are getting kind of killing two birds with one stone. No, they, they, they pay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure they pay, but they don't have to look two places. Exactly. They're like, Glenn is our guy. Yeah. He can do all this. One uh, stop shop. Exactly. Yeah, exa there you go. It makes it easy for them to, to window shop. Yeah. It's like, this is our man. Yeah. So, do you, um, how much recording do you do these days? Um, well, you know, I mean, I don't. I mean, a fair amount. I mean, I guess it just, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of live, it's a lot of touring. Yeah. Um, you know, I just recorded yesterday morning with a group called La Mafia in Houston. They, you know, my, my, my boy David de la Garza had found out I was in town and he invited me to their gig and I took the whole band to the gig and then we had a great time with their band and then he said, hey man, you know, we're recording the next single for La Mafia, they have like six Grammys or something like that under their yeah. belt. They've been around since I was a little kid. I remember that name La Mafia since I was a little yeah. kid. So I went and recorded with them yesterday and uh, you know, it was really great. And you know, it's just, you know, here and there I record a couple records. I, I'm recording all the percussion, you know, all the parts and things like that. And you know, so just kind of like, you know, when it come, you know, I'm not like I'm not per se like a studio percussionist. Even though, if you need me to record, I can record. Right. You know, just kind of do it all. Kind of. That's great. Yeah. And um, so talking about the gigs you two guys have scored over the years and the ones you currently have, what advice would you give you know younger cats that are looking up to you guys as you looked up to your mentors? Like as far as a, obviously there's the preparation part and making sure you can you can play what's needed but uh, how important are people skills in, in getting the gig it's very it's very important uh, I can tell you that you know on the, from Nashville uh, networking and communicating and getting out there meeting a lot of people you know it's sometimes not who you know but who knows you and it's important that you get your name out there and play as many gigs as possible. It's, it's the songwriting capital of the world, so there's a lot of smaller venues that you can do songwriting gigs and things of that nature. So for a drummer or percussionist, uh, you just want to get your way um, into that scene and just get your name out there. But uh, slowly but surely, uh, you get into uh, clicks where you have uh, producers that can regularly call you on, on rotation. And but so having, the, having that right attitude is important, but also getting getting your name and networking is a big deal. Right, and so, whatever, 20-year-old thinks he knows everything, shows up to Nashville tomorrow, would, would you recommend he needs to go out on the scene and, and, and start handshaking? And That's it, be seen on the scene and, and meet as many people as you can, whether they're side musicians or um, leaders, producers, just get out and, and be out there. Yeah. Um, it's one thing, you know, Social networking via your phone is one thing, but it doesn't take the place of actually being at a venue or in a studio or whatever and just making sure that you're uh, doing a lot of handshakes and introducing yourself. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, you know, I, I've known some guys that, uh, mutual friends of ours that have, you know, lived the hard life in Nashville and now they're on the, the, the biggest stages in the world. And it's really interesting to, you know, social media technology, there's, nothing that replaces human interaction and, and that's how you're gonna get the gig and, and doing what we do as musicians yeah you can have a machine next to you but if you can't play with the human next to you it's it's all for naught. Right. and if you can't relate to them you know when you're on tour as you guys both I don't know how you said earlier that you, you're on 13 dates this tour is that what you um, said w oh, with, on this song's key life yeah I, I think there are 13 dates and, and how long, 13 dates in like a month, two it's months? One, one month, yeah. One, one month, month, so. Yeah, we left the uh, 16th of uh, March and we'll, we return on the 15th of April. That's, yeah. so, so you're early into the 16th yeah, of March, yeah, yeah, way tomorrow, early into it, yeah. Tomorrow will be the third show. Nice, Yeah. here in Big D. 
Big D American Airlines Arena. Yeah. Yeah. Mavericks, Stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cowboys. That, that's your team? Cowboys, brother, man. Right on. Come in Nashville whole, in a few weeks. Go Titans. Whole, the whole valley. You know, man, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah. That's yeah. cowboy country, brother. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. You know? Yeah. But, you know, um, to add to what the, the question about, about um, you know, the young kids, that, you know, I think that the most important thing is that, you know, you have to check your ego at the door and you have to really, you have to just people skills. You have to, a musical director is going to hire you, not necessarily because you have the chops or because, you know, you're, you're thin or you have tattoos you know sometimes it's like that in some in some instances not all the time but the most important thing is to make the people that are around you the musicians the musical directors feel that if I was gonna hire you for a gig we're gonna go out for four months is your attitude or is your vibe gonna be cool to be on the road, stuck on the road with you for four months. Right. And, and a lot of times that has a lot of weight, you know, on you getting a tour, you know? And, you know, some tours are really heavy into the playing thing and some, some you know, you just, it, it's just, you're a fixture. You're out there just, you know, doing, you know, maybe it's a pop thing or, you know, who knows, it, it depends. But, you know, all, 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 a lot of it is, is, is making the people around you feel comfortable. You know, right? And you being able to communicate, and I'm a big, I'm really big on learning your instrument. You know, you have to absolutely have yeah. to learn about it. You know, you have to know where it comes from. Yeah, I mean, I I'm very very big on that because I, I I I'm from Texas, but I play all these Afro Cuban instruments and all these all these other things that I didn't grow up with. You know, uh -huh. and it's a whole nother world, but. It's very important, you know, that, that if you don't just get it because it, it, it looks cool and like, you know, like learn about it, you know, and, 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 and kind of, you know, be, you know, learn how to play, you know, it's very, very, very important. That's I what agree. makes, that's what makes people, that's what makes you, you know, aside from the other one, because anybody can buy a drum kit. Right. Anybody can buy a, a, a conga, anybody can buy a bongo. That's, that's the easy part, some, you know, for some, most, some people, but. But it's it's getting that instrument to sound the way it should sound, and you know when I when I do like like I'm on this uh, Songs of Key Alive tour with Stevie Wonder, I've been part of his band for almost nine years now, and you know it, it's a uh, it's a blessing because Stevie is somebody who's a very creative person. He's very much so into jazz and very much so into creating, and he believes in expression, which is really just expressing yourself. You know the songs. Mm -hmm which is great, but you can't always play a Latin rhythm, Latin grooves, when you're playing, you know, an, a, a soul tune, like a, sometimes it's, you, you know, I, I have the, I have the, um, the, I'm fortunate to where I can kind of mesh and mix in with it and, and kind of make, take, take from the tradition and keep it in, but it's not, I'm not playing solely traditional, I'm kind of just, Kind of hinting and taking yeah, yeah kind of taking from here and there and you know that that's that's um i guess it's important to uh to really respect your instrument and what you do and you know don't drink don't do drugs don't you know do, don't show up like if you know don't show up like if you just you know yeah don't, you know just be re you have to be responsible like a, like a job you know if you it is a you job, sh yeah, yeah if you show up to if you're a banker if you can't show up you know, crazy. Right. Like we just came from spring break, 1990. <laughs> you know exactly. what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's it's that. You know, you know that that that'll give you the success. You know, how do you get these big tours? How do you know? How do you you know? It's it's that. So it's all. That. And when you get up to the, the, the big level where where both of you are now, and you're talking about auditioning and that whole thing, when going back to how you got the Stevie Wonder gig. Was that recommendations? Did you know the musical director? Did you know somebody in the band? That was that was recommendation from uh, from a, another percussionist in, in L.A. That uh, actually, you know, um, there was there was there was a big musical director who worked with Stevie, and 
Steve said, hey, I'm putting a new band together and, you know, we need this, this, and this. So then that guy told, uh, asked his percussionist, hey, man, who do you recommend? And he threw out a bunch of names. And, you know, I was just one of those guys and I got called for the audition. And it was a very, um, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a cattle call. It was invitation only type thing. And, you know, I did it. Yeah. And was that was that audition with with the live band or was it with the recordings? A or? live band. Everything with Stevie is live, brother. That's cool. There ain't no pro tool, there ain't no nothing. It just it's real deal, plain. That's you awesome. Know? If you hear a shaker in the audience, that's because somebody's playing a shaker. Somebody's playing a shaker. You know? Hopefully it's you. You know, well, there's two <laughs> percussions. So, <laughs> so it may or may you know, not. It could, yeah, it may or yeah. may not be. But you know, that's the greatest, the great thing about that 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 situation. That's that cool. And. Like how you get your gigs? Is it at, at this point in your life? Is it more recommendations? The, the networking you've done it's in the it, past? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, just a lot of word of mouth and just uh, you know, the, the degrees of separation between myself and maybe a musical director is, is just one or two, and it, it doesn't take much. So, uh, but yeah, paid the dues in the past to get to that point. So, cool. Um, so I know we're limited on time. I wanted to ask some kind of when you guys are on like a huge stage like Fausto's going to be on tomorrow and you're in a big arena um, this is from my own curiosity as well as everybody else as a percussionist what what do you like in your in your ears or do you prefer wedges over your ear over the in-ears uh, what when it's uh, an arena like the like the you know American Airlines arena they'll be anywhere from what maybe 18 to 20,000 people right there you know it'll be sold out it's always good to have in-ear monitors, you know, in that situation. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very personal, personalized, you know, subject, you know. It's right. Like some, some percussionists may want no bass in there or, or a lot of bass, you know. So it's just kind of like getting your mix in, but the ears are very important at that level, you know. Right. Like big arena. Seasons are high. Yeah, you, know, you want to hear yourself. Yeah, and the ears well. are important. I feel that you know you just have to have a good mix. Uh, I I prefer to have as little as possible and and um, and not to get too overbearing as far as what I'm hearing. Um, but uh, just a good mix. Make sure that you can hear yourself. But um, you know if you're locking with a, if you're a percussionist that wants to lock with a drummer and bass player and other rhythm section, yeah, you got to make sure that you have a a good mix of those guys. You know, good kick snare hat, good fundamental with the bass. Make sure you can hear yourself. Mm. That's important. And if it's uh. I'm gonna show my ignorance here. I've never seen Stevie Wonder live, and I'm, I think it's got to be the, the the biggest kick as a performer. But on stage, I would assume there are some open-ended, like, is everything exactly mapped out, or are there some open oh, parts yeah. of songs? And it, it's uh, with Stevie, you never know. So I mean, you got it. I'm sure you got to have his vocals. In, in your mix as oh, well because yeah. he may oh, just yeah. decide to go another round or absolutely yeah absolutely yeah absolutely yeah i mean yeah, definitely i mean in in uh with a band of that magnitude and, and the music being so incredible and detailed and yeah you have to have everything you know it, it just everything in it and you know stevie's one of those guys that if he just wants to go one other round he may or if you know what he may, Maybe done. He's one of those guys that say, hey, surprise, and he'll just start like giant steps really fast. And Stevie is one of those guys that he's so unique and it's it's, it's so great because, you know, the, no two shows are the same. Hey, surprise. Your fans out there are asking for you. <laughs> I can feel my phone lighting up. Okay. So yeah. so, yeah, we need to wrap this up. I um, want to th thank Fausto and Glenn. We're about to have an amazing clinic here. Um, Thank you guys very much, uh -huh. and we'll see you next time you're in town. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye.